Hello, I'm Alison Lagrange coming to you from Durban, South Africa. Today we have a special show for you, Resurgent Africa. Amid the coups and the crises, there are many positive stories from Africa that often get overlooked, but not on this show. Today we take you to countries around Africa to tell you stories of hope, positivity and innovation and give you a glimpse into the lives of the people who call this vibrant continent home. People often say it's hard to be a woman in a man's world, which is why stories of women shattering glass ceilings and standing shoulder to shoulder with men resonate more. But what happens when the roles are reversed? When a man steps into fields traditionally dominated by women? He too faces the sting of criticism the weight of prejudice, and the mockery of those who can't see beyond stereotypes. Yet there are those who walk boldly through the storm of societal expectations, undeterred by the whispers and doubts. One such trailblazer is Nigeria's own world-charming Smart Courage, a professional catwalk coach based in Lagos. For the past 15 years, Courage has been redefining what it means to be a man in a space often reserved for women. Hello guys, my name is Walt Chamin Smart Courage. I'm a fashion work consultant, creative artistic director and a fashion stylist. Carving out a unique niche in a country deeply rooted in conservative values. Everybody, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go back, let's roll it now. In Nigeria, where cultural and religious norms often dictate gender roles, smart success is nothing short of revolutionary. Okay. Despite the naysayers who question his path, he remains steadfast, refusing to let doubt or criticism veer him off course. With a degree in genetics and biotechnology, his journey into fashion might seem unexpected. But for Smart, it was destiny. Inspired by his mother, a woman deeply embedded in the world of fashion, he found himself drawn to the art of working with women. She runs several businesses and majorly fashion business and that really, I would say, influenced my choices when I was growing up because I see her look really exceptionally good and maybe that influenced me in wanting to work with women, see them look good and carry themselves well. A passion that has seen him train countless models who have represented Nigeria on the global stage. When he takes the stage strutting confidently down the catwalk in platform stilettos, his female trainees watch in awe. His talent for storytelling and his meticulous eye for detail set him apart, and he encourages every model to embrace what makes them unique. For Smart, the catwalk is not just about theatrics, it's an extension of a person's identity. Like I always say, having good manners, carrying yourself well is not like a suit you wear to impress people and take off when you get home. It should be embedded in you. So there's what we call the talking process. We go through your vulnerable state, allow you to come in terms with that before we start educating and teaching you on how to carry yourself. And with that, it has been easy so far. So one thing I do is I break through the individual I am trying to work with. Once they have opened up to you, any other thing is easy. Over the years, he has trained over 3,000 women to walk with confidence and grace. But how does he cope with the criticism that comes with his profession? I know my purpose, I know my goal, I know what I am looking for. But Nigerians do not understand. Once it does not go, I'll go in line with what they think and your ideologies, you are the worst. Furthermore, if I go hungry, will they feed me? No, they would not. They will still insult me, so that's fine. Smart's approach is simple, let the work speak for itself. With an impeccable record, he has earned his place in the fashion industry without the need for explanations. Most times you get to a situation whereby they introduce you as a coach and everybody's like, why would a man be teaching me how to work and all that? I keep quiet, I don't reply, I don't even answer. I go on and do my job and it's later they will come back to you and say, oh my God, you're good at what you do. Exactly, that is how you reply them. There's no need bantering words with people. Let the job do the talking, that's all I do. Reflecting on the breakthrough moments of his career, Smart's pride is evident. 
He recalls coaching Nigerian model Tosin Adeduro, who became the fourth runner-up in Miss World Tourism. Tosin came to me and said, Mr. Smart, are we ready to do this? I said, let's do it together. When she traveled, people were not posting her, people were not talking about her. But as God could have it, she became the fifth runner-up of Miss World, Miss Tourism World, ever. For a very long time, one of the first black girls to break the rules. And that was beautiful. When, we, when she came back, we were like, yes, we did it. It was really refreshing to know that you only have limitations that you set for yourself. Today, Smart enjoys a following of over 400,000 on TikTok and Instagram. But he knows his journey is far from over. The transitioning from being a cattle coach to a stylist, initially I hate being called a stylist. But understanding that is a package look, is a package on its own. You finish training a girl and she goes out, she doesn't look the part. Your job is a messed up already. So I wanted the people I work with to look exquisite. In a world that often tries to confine us to roles defined by others, world charming smart courage stands as a testament to the power of perseverance and self-belief. His story reminds us that no matter the odds, breaking through the barriers society places on us is not just possible, it's necessary. In the heart of Benin, the capital city of Porto Novo buzzed with excitement as a brand new festival took center stage. The Porto Novo Mask Festival, a three-day celebration, welcomed participants from across Benin and neighboring countries like Togo and Burkina Faso. The streets thrummed with traditional music, while the air was alive with the energy of acrobats and stilt walkers perched on towering eight-meter poles. It was a vibrant, colorful spectacle filled with the spirit of both celebration and reverence. You've seen that the people are very happy, they're expressing themselves, they're having a good time. And I think this is how we're going to show people that Benin is full of cultural potential. The festival wasn't just about entertainment, it was a celebration of Benin's rich cultural heritage and a proud display of the country's deep-rooted traditions. The event was launched by the government and city officials to replace the usual Porto Novo International Festival held in January, and it was a stunning success. Crowds marveled at the rare appearance of masked and costumed figures, some of which are usually kept hidden away in their respective regions. The festival was a dazzling mix of secular and religious masks, showing the profound connection between the people and their ancestral spirits. Our parents had hidden voodoo masks, but the rest of us, like everything else, are now rediscovering, so we are bringing them out. There, the masks that came out of Voodoo Hound, it is their pride. They are internationally recognized. Among the festival's main attractions were the Gonuko, towering masked figures native to Porto Novo, and the Zangbeto, the traditional Vodun guardians of the night. These figures, along with the rare Hunve mask, captivated the audience, leaving a lasting impression on all who witnessed their grandeur. We saw masks being paraded and we thought it was extraordinary. It reminded me of some shots from the Caribbean when you watch a festival and I wasn't expecting to have a nice surprise like that in Benin. The quality was exceptional. The organization was super. Truly congratulations. The festival was more than just a cultural showcase. It was an opportunity to shine a spotlight on Porto Novo and to promote tourism. The city's mayor proudly noted that the event put Porto Novo in the spotlight, attracting visitors from near and far. Earlier in the year, the government had also revamped Benin's famous voodoo festival, underscoring its commitment to preserving and promoting the country's cultural heritage. Today, we're making it more professional and we're positioning ourselves, especially in relation to masks. From now on, Porto Novo is a city that will be stand out and set itself apart, because we now have an event that really puts us in the spotlight, the Festival of Masks. So, as the festival came to a close, there was a sense of fulfillment in the air. 
Porto Novo had not only celebrated its past, but had also set the stage for a future where its traditions and culture would continue to thrive. The Porto Novo Mask Festival was more than just an event. It was a testament to the enduring beauty and wealth of Benin's cultural heritage. And for those who attended, it was an unforgettable experience, filled with joy, pride and a deeper understanding of the rich tapestry that is Benin. Millions of children across the world suffer from vision impairment. In Africa, there are around 5 million such children. The impairment impacts the education of many of them as access to Braille texts remains a major challenge in the region. But a group of Ugandan developers has come up with a solution. They have developed a blind assistant app that helps in reading documents aloud. When we want to open our screen, 1933. I open the screen with two fingers, then I go to application. The app eliminates the compulsion for students to seek assistance to do their everyday learning. The app works through a smartphone's camera, mobility and connectivity. This application is a mobile software app. Once you install it on a smartphone, Android, it turns a smartphone into a device that can read ordinary printed text. In addition, it can detect currency. It can also be used to identify objects. The app is built by a local company called Suzy Water Harvesting. It allows learners to read text in real time on their own without the help of another student or teacher. Students can scan texts without having to translate them into Braille and then they hear the audio version of the scanned text. Other learners are given say text to be able to read. And for them, since they cannot be able to read texts which are in print, the first option will be to get their peers in free time to be able to read for, for them the same text as they are brailing the text. And they will be able to read that text after some time. But now with the, the assistive technologies which has been given, the braille assist, they are able to scan these texts without having to translate them into braille. To access the technology, Ugandan students are undergoing training. They are being taught how to use a smartphone. Blind assistant version 2, which is look out. The excitement among the students is visible as many of them hold a smartphone for the very first time. We first trained them on how to use the smartphone. We found that some had not even caught it in their hands. They were so excited having it and being trained on how to operate it. And introducing the blind assistant application was something that was welcomed by them. Since now they do not need much assistance, they can read. In fact, for examination time, they do not need to spend 30 minutes outside the examination room for the text to be transferred to Braille. The students are learning to use the Blind Assistant app in multiple Ugandan schools. The Kagwa Secondary School in the central Ugandan district of Mukono was the first to receive the training. After one week's training, the school's visually impaired students were awarded certificates. Each of them was given a new mobile device to help with lessons. Currently, smartphones are given to the students for free after training. Students say the app is benefiting them. They say the training will help beyond the classroom. The blind assistant has come to solve all those problems. We are able to read on our own and in the time that we want. Given the feature of Explore, I can use it as I'm traveling, that it can assist me to, to read whatever I'm passing by. Currently, around 1,500 students in Uganda are visually impaired. App developers hope to equip more than 1,000 students. With a success in achieving the goal, they can ensure that vision disability does not come in the way of a bright future for these young children.
From 2020 to 2023, East Africa witnessed its worst drought in almost 40 years. The dry spell especially hit the arid and semi-arid regions of Kenya, affecting close to 3 million people. Families were left without food and water. At least 100,000 children suffered severe malnutrition and lack of sanitation exposed the population to numerous illnesses. Not just humans, but animals also took the brunt of the deadly disaster. The three years of below-average rainfall claimed the lives of 2.6 million cattle, which died of thirst and hunger. The scenes were horrifying, as one could see the decomposing carcasses of livestock everywhere. And households that relied on only rearing cattle were left with nothing. The four years of drought had snatched away everything, including their livelihoods. But since then, the people of Kenya have moved on from the misery. They are now turning to other sources of income, and one of them is fish farming. For the women of the Maasai tribe in Kenya's Kajiado, fish farming is proving to be a profitable profession. With training from the government, these farmers are now selling one fish for up to 300 shillings or over 2 US dollars. We are still livestock keepers, however, due to climate change, most of the time we experience drought, forcing us to relocate to other areas and our cattle still die. So when the county government introduced us to this fish farming project, we gladly received it because we considered it as an alternative source of livelihood. The Kajiado government supplies pond liners, Nile tilapia fish, and feed to indigenous people. And all they have to do is allocate a portion of their land to create a fish pond and harvest the batch of fish after six months. When drought came for four consecutive years, we were severely affected. Our cows died, our sheep died. We were left with nothing. Our cows died, the lands were left bare, with nothing for the cows to graze on. So, I decided to set aside a piece of land to rear fish and monitor how they would perform because I realized it's a good source of food. I can also take it to the market, sell, and educate my children with the proceeds. The initiative aims to help families in the Kajiado region by diversifying their income and providing a buffer against the climate crisis. The project is also encouraging fish consumption in the Maasai community to escape hunger and malnutrition. To address this issue of land scarcity, changes in, changes in livelihood systems due to climate change, uh, the program uh, has seen some importance to have uh, fish farming in the rural setups so that at least they have alternative livelihoods and have a diversification of food systems in order to address issues of food insecurity and malnutrition within the households. With climate change impacting the world in ways we cannot imagine, shocking scenes of emaciated cows and dead sheep could become more common. However, empowering remote communities like the one in Kenya can help fight back and provide a way to improve their lives. The food chain is like a grand buffet of life. One creature on the menu is a must-have for another. The food chain isn't just a fancy restaurant, it's more like an interconnected web of branches where everyone depends on someone else's avocado toast. If a critter goes MIA or pulls a power move, the whole system gets as unstable as a Jenga tower at a party. Take rhinos, for example. These big, lovable tanks of the animal kingdom aren't just important, they are the VIPs, the keystone species that keeps the ecosystem's party going. They're the ultimate landscapers, munching through vegetation like it's an all-you-can-eat offer. And in turn, they help shape Africa's fabulous savannas. For years, animal welfare activists and scientists have been sweating bullets trying to save these magnificent beasts. It was like watching a slow drip of water into an empty jug. 
agonizing. But guess what? That jug is finally filling up. South Africa just announced a miraculous dip in rhino poaching in the first half of 2024. Now, before we all start popping champagne, let's give credit where it's due. The Victory Lap is partly thanks to a dehorning program that kicked off in April. According to the latest stats, 229 rhinos were killed from January to June, a slight but also sweet decline compared to last year. Dehorning is like giving rhinos a safe haircut, removing their horns to make them less appealing to poachers. It's drastic, but think of it as a preventive makeover that's safe and painless for the rhino. It's one of the best ways to keep those critically endangered black rhinos and their slightly less endangered white cousins alive and kicking. Environment Minister Dion George gave a shout-out to the dehorning efforts in KwaZulu-Natal, particularly in Luluwe Imfolozi Park, where over a thousand rhinos have had their horns trimmed since April. In South Africa, every single day a rhino is killed for its horn. It's one of the most tragic trends out there, with rhino horn being used in traditional medicines or flaunted as a status symbol. The rhino horn is made up of keratin, the same stuff in our hair and nails, but apparently it's more exquisite when it's ripped from a dead rhino. As of the end of 2023, South Africa had 16,056 rhinos, including 2,065 black and 13,991 white rhinos. According to the International Union for Conservation of Nature, black rhinos are the VIPs on the endangered list. But it's not all gloom and doom. The government's crackdown on poaching has led to over 60 arrests in the first half of 2024. The police have confiscated guns and secured convictions. In a scene that looked like something came to reality from a sci-fi film, scientists injected radioactive material into rhino horns to make them easier to track at border posts. The Environment Ministry says that despite the poaching horrors, the rhino population in South Africa has increased by 1,023 from 2021 to 2023. The fight to save rhinos is full of highs and lows, but the recent dip in poaching is a win worth celebrating. It's a reminder that every little effort counts, and together we can make a difference. Because in this chain of life, every link is priceless. And that's all we have time for on the show for today. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned to First Post. Across continents, one powerful news source. Bringing you diverse perspectives on the issues that matter. We go beyond the boundaries to give you that little extra about every sporting moment. So thank you for making First Post 5 million strong. We're counting on your support and you can trust us to bring you the news unfiltered and unvarnished. Climate change is on our doorstep. It's time for a revolution to take root. And it starts with 1.4 billion Indians. It starts with one tree. One tree for humanity. One tree for Mother Earth. One tree for our future. Project One Tree, a News 18 Network initiative. Western 